um, people say argument runs. It's a bit like Mother's Day. Uh, you should be remembering Mother every day, uh, not just on the commercial enterprise of the second Sunday of May. Uh, and you, you can see that the, the logic in that. And yet, there is just something special about a hundred years. Isn't it? What about Father's Day? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we're such gentle fellows that we don't need any, any remembrance. Um, but um, the, 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 the century when somebody's in, the cricketer's in the naughty, not the naughty 90s, the nervous 90s, um, he, he's, he's nervous because he wants to, to get there to the 100. Uh, old Tom Killen, another nine squadron sig. Uh, he's not too well at the moment. I spoke to his wife yesterday. Um, but he's trying to hang on until September uh, when he'll be celebrating his century. He, he was born just a few months after Anzac Day in 1915. Um, when Henry V, not the real one, but Shakespeare's one, when he was psyching the troops up before Agincourt. Uh, he said, if I remember rightly, something like, um, it was on Crispin's Day, and Crispin's Day, I think, is about the 28th of September, and they said, and Crispin the Crispian shall ne'er go by, but we in it shall be remembered. Well, uh, <coughs> we, we're not, you know, I, I couldn't tell you what day Agincourt was, apart from, from Crispin's Day, but, we do make a bit of an effort to, to remember them. And uh, he said in that same speech, this story shall the good man teach his son or his daughter or his granddaughter. And that's one of the things we try to do on Anzac Day. Um, but um, it happens every, every April, every 25th of April, is it Anzac Day, just like today? Um, the politicians and the journalists talk about the special significance of the hundred years. And uh, as I said, I, I think you, there is something special about it, but it's emotional rather than logic, logical. Logically, it is just the same as any other Anzac Day. Uh, and the, the politicians and journalists, they, they speak about the national significance. And you've all read that so many times that you don't need me to elaborate on it, what it means for the nation. But it has, and I think this is more important for us, it has a personal significance. See, so something else that happened a hundred years ago today. You remember our long-term president, Harry Mackay, one of the, the three Mackay brothers. Um, one of his nephews is here today. Now, uh, Harry, uh, his middle name was Sawley, Harry Sawley Mackay. And Andrew was telling me that the reason that he was called Harry Sawley was because his uncle, Harry Sawley, was killed 100 years ago today on the Gallipoli. That's, that's the sort of the, the personal aspect of it, which I think is much more important than this uh, uh, trumped up national significance. Uh, uh, trumped up is quite fair. It, it, it's, it is a real thing, but uh, for me, the personal aspect is more important. Um, just the other day, I went to a funeral. Reg and I were there. The Seventh Squadron man. Uh, we couldn't find anybody else still alive and able to get around from Seven Squadron who could attend that funeral. But there were two young fellows there who were the sons of his mates that had served in New Guinea with him. Their fathers were dead, so they still came along to Jeff Lason's funeral. Now, isn't that a wonderful thing that you've got to have that fellowship? That family. But if 
you can bear with me just for a few more minutes, uh, I'd like to read you some letters that my uncle wrote home to his elder sister, my mother. Um, he was uh, called Charles Reynolds Baboo. He was born in October 1894, and he died of wounds in August 1915. Um, so he was still only 20. He hadn't, hadn't qualified to vote when he, he was killed at Lone Pine. Uh, and my mother kept uh, all his letters home from the war and from the coronation contingent in 1910 and from the time in between. He wrote to her on the 12th of July 1914. He was managed overseer on the big sheep station halfway between uh, Forbes and Condobor. And he said, Bramble's being sold and I might be out of a job soon. Um, a week later, he wrote to his father and he said, well, I've got the manages. Uh, they might keep me on until shearing, but after that I'll, I'll have to move on. Um, he said, I've, I've got a few quid in the bank and I've got a good horse, I'll get another job, no problem. Um, and as you all know, war was declared on the 4th of August 1914, Tuesday the 4th of August. Um, on Sunday the 23rd of August, he wrote from the army camp in Randwick, um, num regimental number 70, 70, the 2nd Battalion, Infantry Battalion. And uh, he'd, he'd heard from some other relative, he said that uh, Oh, apparently you didn't get my letter saying that I signed up uh, last week. We left Condo, that's Condo Berlin, we left Condo on Saturday. Now that would have been the 15th of August, 11 days after the declaration of war. Left Condo on Saturday, 22 strong. We were accompanied to the station by the local band. Went straight to the encampment at Randwick and then on the 31st of August, he writes again, says, um, um, we'll be here till we embark, which I think will be at the end of this week. At least I hope so. Um, of course, they, they just, they didn't have to think about joining up. Um, there's a fellow called uh, Joe Gutt. He used to be an ambassador to, Australian ambassador to Greece, I think he was. He wrote a book called Not As a Duty Only. Uh, it's a story of his time with the 2nd and 5th Infantry Battalion, but the title relates to his reasons for joining up. And he says, uh, we, we saw it as a duty, but that wasn't all. It was what you did. Uh, England's in trouble, uh, Australia could be in trouble, so you join up. And that was in 1939, so you can imagine it was much more pronounced back in 1914 when three quarters of the population would have had either a parent or a grandparent who was born in the United Kingdom. In Charles' case, it was his great grandparents. Uh, anyway, up they joined. Um, 16th of September, he said, oh, well, we're still here, but we're really off this time. We're embarking tomorrow morning, 07.30. Uh, then, a few days later, oh, another disappointment. We're all ready to go to the boat when they said it's been postponed indefinitely. Um, and they had a good reason for it at that time, um, because the end was reported to be about. But I, I mention all this chopping and chanting just to show you that the army hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, he, he writes again from Colombo and he writes from, from Egypt. Um, he writes to, to his father to seek permission to, or consent to his accepting a commission. And then he writes on the 17th of March, on the 24th of March, he says, This morning I was called up to the divisional headquarters where I was informed that I had been granted the commission, but they gave me an option uh, if I take it. I'll have to remain in Egypt on my present plate of pay as a sergeant by then and go into an infantry training camp and finally be uh, drafted into a regiment. The other choice was remain where I am in the ranks and go.
go straight into action, Ma Fish Commission. I turned it down absolutely. The man who says I'm mad for a fight, and I think they'll make things fly when they do. Now that's March. 4th of April, uh, that's the postcard. Last night we got 24 hours notice to leave, so we've been pretty busy. Uh, I think we're bound for the Dark World, he said. Ought to see some action shortly. The following day he boards a true ship, troop ship, and he sends them a postcard. That's 100 years ago last Wednesday week, 15th of, 5th of April. Oh, sorry, 15th of April. A uh, postcard with OAS and the SA on the top right hand corner, and some of you will remember that means on active service, no staffs available. So he saved a penny, 60, 65 cents, 70 cents. Um, but anyway, he just it's a very formal thing. This is the last time I'll be able to write for a while. I'm in excellent health and have all that is required. Well, in fact, he didn't get another chance to write for another month, 15th of May. And by that time, of course, they'd landed on the 25th, and you, you know the rest of the story. Um, <clears throat> but uh, by the 15th, he's been wounded, he's been in hospital on Lebanon, he's back with the unit again. Um, got, a, got a few bits of glass in his, in his face because he was looking in the, in the periscope when a turkey sniper hit the glass. 15th of June, oh, he says it's monotonous now, sitting in a trench, watching the Turks in their trenches a hundred yards away, just like a pair of Kilkenny cats, it says, glaring and spitting at one another with an occasional mix-up for luck. <laughs> then he's commissioned in the field, no, no, no officer training course this time, and he writes to his elder brother, Alan, and I'd like to just read you a few lines from this letter. It's dated the 3rd of August, 1915. He said, it's going on for some weeks since we landed, and during that time we've worked incessantly, mainly with pick and shovel, and on pretty poor tucker, absolutely without a spell. This quantity is almost a record. The battalion, Steve's still with the 2nd Battalion, and um, it's purple over green, the same as the 2nd, 2nd now. Um, the battalion, in spite of five batches of reinforcements, is reduced to less than half strength, mainly through sickness. And the men are absolutely dead beat. Very shortly, and he means tomorrow morning, very shortly we have to pop out and take the trenches opposite, which the Turks have had three months to fortify. We shall take the trench, but there'll be dirty work at the crossroads. Personally, I consider that if any of the starting party returns, they could be safe <coughs> in taking a ticket in taps. The reinforcements who come in after will carry the day. I will lead a platoon in the first line of the charge, so that's why I'm marking this note. If anything should happen to me, Father should draw about 90 quid in pay and a fiver or so in blood money. <coughs> I'm quite prepared to pass in the marble as it is in a good cause, and the cove has to go sometime. So long, you're a excellent brother. Well, he didn't get as far as the Turkish trenches, but he was shot in the throat. He was able to walk back to the beach, uh, survived till he got to hospital in mortar, and then he died a few days later. Uh, still only 20. As late as 1940, in the cadet camp, uh, I was in the cadet camp with Tony Hanley in 1942, but I don't think he was at that 1941. Uh, and there was a retired general, the first first war general, who was telling us all we should join up. Uh, put your age up and join up. Uh, he'd be lynched if he did that today, 14 and 15 year olds. Tony did it at 17. Uh, I'll just leave you, I think I've, I've said probably more than enough, just a few lines from the poet Alfred Houseman. He said, here then we lie, because we did not choose to live and shame the land from which we sprung. Life, to be sure, is nothing much to lose, but young men think it is, and we were young.